On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology and in collaboration with Neurology Today, it gives me great pleasure to have Dr. Joseph Safdie back with us. Dr. Safdie is not only the editor-in-chief of Neurology Today, the official news source of the American Academy of Neurology, but also an associate professor of neurology at Weill Cornell Medicine and, and my close colleague. Dr. Safdie, it's been two weeks uh, since we last talked, and um, I kind of can't even believe um, what's happened in the last two weeks. Um, first of all, we're wearing masks. Uh, that's one change um, due to uh, federal guidance. Uh, we have an explosion of, of new information out there. Neurology Today has been doing, honestly, just a, a heroic a stellar job at getting information out there. Um, Joe, why don't you tell me a little bit about um, what Neurology Today has been up to um, and maybe what the plans are um, so that neurologists and, and uh, members of the academy uh, can, uh, can look forward to being informed and educated. Great, Richard. Thanks so much for having me back again. Um, neurology Today has really been trying to fill that gap between what neurologists are probably reading about in the national media and in national journals you know, that really are not specific to any one specialty, really about, you know, the COVID situation overall, the, you know, the, the, the case rates in the United States, the local case rates in their individual sort of cities and states, and of course, you know, the impact on, on patients. But I think where neurology today can really fill in, a, uh, fill in a gap is where that applies directly to neurologists and neurology practices and neurology training pipelines. You know, that's something that you know, the, 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 the national press and the general medical sort of journals aren't going to talk a lot about. And there certainly is a lot to, to talk about there. And we've been quite busy with a number of, of you know, initiatives that have really been um, assigned to cover those areas. And so I'm happy to sort of t to talk about those if you, if, if you think that would be helpful. Sure. I mean, I think one of the one of the things I guess we're learning is that you know the potential neurologic complications of COVID, um, and I you know I'm going to use the, the word potential because you know we're we're still kind of can I can we take these masks off now? Yeah, I think so. you know the guidance is when you're out and about. We're in our offices now, so I just finished seeing patients. So I think great I'm mask off. Okay, no, I can breathe. Fogging up. <laughs> Still uh, coughing. Um, anyway, so the neurologic complications, um, you know, the first report came out about anosmia and we covered that a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I, you and I were on a morning report where, you know, the, we were kind of had a, a, a spirited conversation where someone said, oh, it's probably not real anosmia. Probably they just have a stuffy nose so they can't smell. And I said, no, actually, I mean, I have air moving through my nose. I can't smell anything. Um, literally, I could stick my head in bleach and not smell anything. And I was, uh, my whole family's book was, and ended up being COVID positive. Um, aside from anosmia, um, what else have we learned? Um, and what, what do you think is something that uh, neurologists out there in practice need to know about potential neurologic complications? Great. And I, I think this is a question which we're still learning a lot about. At this point in time, we don't know for sure whether COVID specifically directly is neuroinvasive. We do know that other coronaviruses, MERS and SARS, which, uh, you know, from 10 or 20 years ago, did have some patients who had clear neurologic manifestations. And so it, 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 it probably is the case that a small percentage of coronavirus COVID-19 patients will have neurologic manifestations. We just don't know for sure. But Neurology Today has covered a couple of things that have come out. One of them was a recent sort of report in the literature on an acute necrotizing encephalopathy associated with COVID-19. I think that was out of Detroit, but I could be wrong. And that was a case report and the, the imaging there was very profound and, and very dramatic. And of course, the question is, is that a direct neuroinvasive effect of COVID? Is that perhaps an immune response post-COVID? You know, again, um, anytime you expose a large population of patients to a new virus, um, you're going to activate their immune systems. And of course, some of those patients will develop sequelae, you know, things like ADEM. Certainly, I think we'll see an uptick in Guillain-Barre syndrome. But the question is, is there a primary uh, neuroinvasion of, of, of COVID? And, and that's still being, um, being addressed. Uh, as to your loss of smell question, you know, on April 4th, we published an article uh, in Neurology Today where we asked some of our experts about whether they think loss of smell is potentially um, an actual neuroinvasive symptom of coronavirus, of COVID-19, or whether it might actually be that the olfactory bulb is involved, that the uh, cribriform plate, you know, as the, as the, um, as the olfactory uh, roots go, go through are involved, or is it perhaps an ENT issue, which I think some of our experts really agree with you, Richard, it probably isn't because these patients, many of them don't actually have rhinorrhea, they don't feel stuffy, no, you know, they don't have a stuffy nose, and yet they simply can't smell. So we're not sure yet, but uh, I, would, I, would, I would ask our, our viewers to take a look at that article because it actually did have some, some interesting information about that.
I was still muted. Apologize. I was coughing, so um, didn't want to explode the microphone. Um, still getting over the silly cough. Um, but you know, there's a lot of case reports coming out, um, and you know, Journal of Neurology um, is is you know hoping to fast track some of these. Um, several uh, you know journals, uh, JAMA uh, Network has been publishing a lot. Um, you know, New England Journal is publishing a lot. There's there's lots of st- lots of Lancet, of course. How how I guess. Um, how do you recommend a neurologist um, takes all of these potential case reports? Because they are really just that potential, not a hundred percent certain yet, you know, we should probably all try to work together with different medical centers to try to put, you know, group papers together. Um, do you have any just kind of gestalt or guidance about um, the, the lack of, um, you know, certainty about some of these neurological complications? Well, I'd like to actually even take a step back because I think that there are two issues here. One issue is, you know, the potential neuroinvasive complications of COVID-19, which, you know, could be something, could be nothing. We're obviously going to have to do a lot more uh, research to sort of be sure. But the other, uh, other part of it, which I think is something that is important to look at, is how do we care for COVID-19 in patients who have pre-existing neurologic conditions? To me, that's the much bigger issue because for the rare patient who has some sort of neurologic manifestation, sure, we have to look at those, but we really need to worry more about the common patients who have things like myasthenia gravis, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, you know, uh, ALS, uh, MS, you know, these patients either have neuromuscular uh, problems, ventilatory issues, they're on immunosuppressive medications, they're, they have, you know, uh, they, they have mobility problems, they have lung issues, these patients are clearly at much higher risk from COVID. So the question is, how do we protect those patients? But at the same time, how do we do that without um, completely isolating them? Because I think if you take an, a, a, an Alzheimer's patient, for example, and you would know this better than I would, um, right, who is, let's say, in the moderate stages, the worst thing to do to that patient is to isolate them, to take away any of their physical activity, to take away their ability to interact with family and friends. Those are patients who aren't going to be able to use sort of things like video-based technologies and, and, and understand sort of um, how they work as well as a patient who, let's say, is cognitively normal. So I think that while we do need to think about, you know, the, the rare case report here or there, um, and those are frankly really fascinating to read, the reality on the ground is we need to think about how our patients who just have run-of-the-mill neurologic disorders are going to cope with, with, with in this COVID era. And I, and I have a, a lot of concerns about those patients, whether they get COVID or not. Either way, I think the impacts could be pretty profound. Yeah. So what's on the docket for neurology today? You guys have seemingly put out articles, it seems like every day or every other day. Um, maybe just give us a quick rundown of what you've covered in the last few days and what you have planned uh, for the coming week or so. Yeah, no, that's great. And so I think one of the things we, we, we covered is um, thinking about patients who have neurologic conditions and how we manage those, like I sort of discussed. But, you know, there's a couple of other things that we, we, we've been covering that I think are important. One is, you know, what exactly is an essential visit, right? So I think a lot of us are hearing uh, patients should stay home employees should stay home, except for things that are essential, right? Now, of course, the government has deemed liquor stores to be essential, right? But uh, what about doctor's offices, right? And I think that's a real question. And a lot of neurologists are asking that. So when do I need to actually go into the office and bring my patients in versus video visits? And so we, we put together a nice article where we asked some practice specialists in neurology, what would be an essential visit? And what are you doing about things like, for example, injection-based therapies, you know, that, that for a patient that may not be able to come in. So that's something that, that I think a lot of neurologists are asking us about, and, and, and we covered. We did that last week. The other big aspect is the training pipeline. What are our neurology residents doing? A lot of them are getting redeployed nationwide. How are they coping? How are we ensuring that they're getting the support that they need? What is the status on their PPE? We're doing something called Neurology Heroes now. In fact, we'll have our first two profiles coming out this week. Where we profile two neurology residents around the country, and they told us, you know, the, 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 some of the stories, and frankly, uh, I would say almost horror stories as, as how it is, and this is not even in New York City, because uh, frankly, the New York City institutions, the residents have been so busy um, that we haven't really been able to access them, and the, um, frankly, and understandably, the media offices of the hospitals have really not been wanting us to speak one-on-one to the residents. I think there's a concern that there might be some some messaging that 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 that's that's sort of um, um, uh, lost along the way, or or for whatever reason, uh, understandably. Um, so that's something that we're talking about. So we have an article where we interviewed neurology residency program directors. How are they working with their residents? What exactly is, is neurology resident education looking like now? We also have another article where we ask our neurology clerkship directors, 
you know, what are they doing with their medical students, right? And how is that going to impact potentially your pipeline? You can't run clerkships in this traditional way. Uh, you know, the AAN meeting was canceled. Medical students, dozens of them were supposed to go to the meeting to present their research, to network. This might have been their only opportunity. How are we going to replace some of those invaluable um, opportunities? So we, 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 we asked some of our clerkship directors about that, and, and, and we covered that as well. Um, and the other thing I think that really actually got the most, most clicks on our website, interestingly, was we interviewed neurologists in Italy, in Spain, and in France. And we actually have a separate article in each of those countries. Um, and we asked them what it's like on the front lines in those countries. And it's not good. Um, and it hasn't been good. And, and, and I don't know if it's getting better. But certainly it was, it was quite terrible last week and the week before. And it's interesting how many of the neurologists in other countries really just put on their gear and, you know, just functioned as ICU doctors. And they talked to us about uh, how things are over there. So we've certainly been, been, been covering a lot. And even in the U.S., we, we, we did an article also last week on what neurohospitalists are doing and how they're redefining their roles um, in terms of uh, uh, ICU medicine. So we've been doing a lot. We've been, we've been covering a lot. We also um, um, have a contact in the CDC, Dr. Jim Sejvar who is the neurologist who works for the CDC. We had, we, had, we had an article about him that we talked about last time, but we have a new one where he actually gave a nice report to the AA and Board of Directors, and we covered that as well, and that's a Q&A. So I'd, li- I'd recommend everybody take a look at that. That was published a couple of days ago. So we've been doing a lot, and we have more that we're doing. Great. And I can tell you um, the uh, articles you're writing uh, and these videos that we're doing are getting um, views and reads um, from all over the world. Uh, The amount of clicks, the amount of web traffic, the amount of views, it's striking to me. Um, Joe, you and I are kind of, you know, boring and not the most entertaining, but the last video we did was the first one in the series. So we didn't really have any, you know, any you know, oomph behind it at over 2,000 views. I mean, you know, it's a lot. We have 36,000 members and 2,000 views is a lot. Uh, the video, uh, you know, you challenged me to try to see if I can get Sanjay Gupta on and, I don't know, send some random email and I guess it worked out, but, you know, almost 9,000 views. I mean, the, the American Academy of Neurology and Neurology Today, the information is disseminating. I got an email um, from a physician who trained in Cuba. He's now um, you know, on the front lines, he's actually in Bolivia, um, and he's like the only neurologist. Um, period. For I think he, I think he wrote, um, you know, you know, sixty thousand people, and he's the only neurologist there. And and that's this is going to be his job. And the government's asking him, you know, how do you, how should we prepare? What do we need to do from a neurological perspective? What, and what does he do? He emails me and then reads Neurology Today and watches these videos. And I think it's just uh, really, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to put the information out there, but the information is being received. So I just wanted to thank you for all that you're doing. I know things have been completely insane between your job at the medical school and Neurology Today and patients and everything else. But um, I guess just to conclude, um, the next couple of weeks, um, are, I guess we're going to be entering like a new normal. I mean, I don't think things are going to be getting better anytime in the next four to six weeks. I think things uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's six to eight weeks. I, I, it's like impossible to know depending on where you are, but you know, we're entering this new normal um, with, with medical care, uh, you know, with, with social activity, with, with probably everything. Um, neurology today have uh, plans to cover or have already covered some things to help prepare neurologists and, and APPs and other, other, you know, members of the Academy, uh, how things are going to be in the future? Well, I don't necessarily know we can predict how things are going to be tomorrow, let alone in, in the future. I think that we're still sort of in the midst of this, you know, a very acute crisis. And even when we're past these peaks, you know, and, and of course, you know, you and I are, are in New York City, where we are likely peaking, as you said, this is April 7th, we're likely peaking around now. We don't know for sure. But other parts of the country are not going to peak for probably two or three or four weeks. And so I don't think that we're going to see the other side of this for, for, for quite a while. And I think the term new normal is likely the right term because in this kind of, it's almost going to be like a little bit of a post-apocalyptic sort of situation, right? So I don't think we're just going to one day snap our fingers and say we're all back to everything as it was before. Mm-hmm. And neurologists are going to have to prepare for that reality going back into the hospitals, are they going to require, like they're talking about in Italy, antibody testing to show that you've had it before they let you back to a normal, uh, you know, employment? We don't know. Uh, what, are, what are local businesses going to look like? Those that support, you know, um, um, uh, for example, uh, hospitals, the, the staffing for doctor's offices, right? The rents that need to be paid for, for you know, April and May and June. And, and if there's no revenue coming in, how does that work? And, and the small business loans, there's a lot of these 
factors, which of course aren't front and center right now. Front and center right now is making sure that we're taking care of our patients, period. But, you know, ultimately we have to start asking these questions, right? Because, you know, in the end of the day, it's not only about the physician. He may have, he or she may have four or five staff members, may have, you know, um, um, others that rely on them for, you know, for their livelihood. And these are questions that I think we're going to be asking and thinking about. We made a conscious decision not to get too involved in those financial discussions uh, early on, and not because it would seem only uh, to frankly be, you know, um, a little bit tone deaf, and I think it would be, but also because ultimately I think that, you know, when, when we're rushing into the fire, right, we're not thinking so much about those factors, but we do have to start thinking about those to some extent, if not for our, our, ourselves, for the, the staff that work in our offices and rely on us, and especially for those small and medium practices that, that's something that Neurology Today is going to start covering. We already have plans to do that. Um, and and, and our, our readers will start to see that probably later this month and early next month. So that likely on the other end of it, those are the, some of the issues we're going to talk about. How do you rebuild, right, uh, after all this? And how do you start getting back to whatever this new normal is? There are some silver linings. And of course, silver linings are always come out of something really bad. And we prefer that this never happened to get those silver linings. But I think one of them is, you know, this rapid adoption of telemedicine. My God, I mean, you know, like to think, you know, uh, three months ago, right? I mean, uh, I did more telemedicine visits this week than uh, last week, I should say, than I did in the prior six months. And I've been doing telemedicine visits because some of my patients like them. But this sort of rapid push into telemedicine, well, now patients are going to think, well, if I could do telemedicine, maybe I could always do telemedicine, right? So why do I need to come in for a 15-minute migraine follow-up if I'm stable just to, you know, sort of check in? And so I think that's going to be a big change. And um, I also think things like meetings, right? I mean, lots of us now are doing meetings virtually, remotely. You know, medical schools and hospitals have dozens of committees and committee meetings. And oftentimes we run out of our office to get to the meeting, to, to sit in the meeting for an hour, to run back to our office. Well, we've been doing it on Zoom and mostly it's been working okay. And you right. know what? Yeah. Now people with kids, people who may have other, uh, you know, challenges and it may be hard for them to get into these meetings, that's going to open this up to a lot more uh, representation. So I think that there are some silver linings too, and we're going to look at those. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, we, we have this. We have a morning report at eight forty-five every morning. I set my alarm at eight forty-one. Uh, get situated, and, and I, I mean, getting up early. Um, um, eight forty-five is early for me. My my brain is still shut off then usually, but um, I don't think I've missed a morning report for three weeks straight. And um, I love morning report. I wish I could go more often, but now I can just flip it on. And now I, I get as much, if not more out of it, because I can multitask. I can take care of the baby. I could do all these other things, but you can also engage by just pressing the button and you're, you're right back in. And uh, I, I think this is going to change medicine for the better. I think it's going to be better patient care. I mean, right, exactly. Whether it's a migraine or someone with MS who has difficulty with maybe mobility, yeah. it's hard to get into the city. It's hard to get in rural areas. It's hard to be seen. You know, it takes two hours to travel for some people for a 20 minute vid visit. Maybe, maybe video visits are, are really the way to go. So I agree. I think this new normal is going to be different, um, but uh, I, I hope it leads to some, some elements of better, better care. Yeah, I, th I think it will. And of course, the, the question is whether the, um, you know, CMS and other payers will, will sustain this or whether they'll sort of say, no, we're going to go back to how it was. I don't think they'll have a choice. And I think just like, just like um, lots of other industries, like the airline industry, they're going to have to adapt and, you know, recognize that ultimately this may be what the, many of the patients want. Yeah, great. Dr. Safti, Editor-in-Chief, Neurology Today, thank you so much. Um, and if there's anyone out there um, that wants to stay in contact, uh, shoot us an email at elearning at an.com. Uh, literally, we've gotten, um, I've gotten dozens and dozens of emails over the last few weeks. I, I could, I actually still can't believe it. Um, uh, a lot of thank yous. So uh, totally, we're, 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 we're very appreciative of those and a lot of really great suggestions. Um, just uh, for those who are uh, watching these videos, we have uh, a great uh, program coming out. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing a, a variety of people over the next several weeks. So uh, stay tuned. Dr. Safti, thanks again so much. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Bye-bye.